I used to work at a workshop. And if you run your hand up and down the shaft. Right. Just give it a wiggle and play with it then. <laughs> <laughs> This is episode 22. Three. 23. 23. 23. Right, do it again. Guys, I'm Dave and welcome to Maker. This is Nippy. Oh, it all started working on a series in my dad's shed. I followed my dreams and joined the Marines, serving in Afghanistan. Defenders were always part of me. So here we are, building custom machines with my awesome team in Shropshire. We are Maker. Hi guys, I'm Dave and welcome to Maker. This is episode 23 and I'm going to give you a little insight on what we've been up to this last week. For those of you that are familiar to Defenders, if you look under here, you'll notice that there's something missing. We've got rid of the springs and we fitted this car with a drive right airbag system and complemented it with the Ultimate Fox Performance Series. This is the compressor. This is like the brains in the ECU that drives this AM key. AMK airbag suspension kit. So basically, you've got four bags, one on each corner. You've got height sensors on each radius arm and the rear trailing arms. That rigs up to this big loom kit. You've got this IntelliRide controller. Really neat if you can zoom in on this, Chris. You've got the option to fully dump your car. You can drop it side to side, left to right. For the people that do a lot of towing, you can press the middle one at the back and drop the arse end of the car to help you with hitching up. Saves you having to mess about the jockey wheel, basically. Very, very neat kit. This whole kit is literally everything that you need to fit an air ride kit. You could fit it yourself. We're happy to supply this kit as a DIY fit kit, but it is, it is very in-depth, so we do recommend that leave it to the specialists. These are the Fox Shocks that we've basically added to the kit is basically the ultimate upgrade. These are the boots that we add to protect these shafts from our salt. This is the airbag tank. So this is what stores the the air pressure, ready for when you hit that button to up or down. So this is Marcus, he's a good friend of ours from Team Affinity. Yep. Marcus has good contacts with the bodybuilding industry. Is it the strongest man in the UK? Strong man. And he's dragged me out of the, um, the archives of, let's like say, slacking in the gym and dragging me once a week and to the point where I can't walk properly today. So excuse me if I'm walking like John Wayne. Marcus has come here for a bit of a change of scenery. So today we're going to fit this monstrous Hornet 2 to you know, the Ultra 4 car. <laughs> it's one big lump of billy. <laughs> Is this using all your strong man skills? <laughs> it helps. Land it on there, mate. Does help. There you got it. Doesn't help it's put in grease. <laughs> so this monstrous thing is going to be going in the front of the Ultra 4 car. Fresh off the production line and delivered this morning. Old, is it? But it's been really useful for me being able to do what I do and train with Dave. Uh, certainly, I think helps him out having that release, being able to, you know, probably get rid of some of your daily frustrations and take it out on a bit of tin is is no bad thing. So, Sam, does Dave have frustrations? Yeah, he doesn't show them very often. So, one bat is at the stage of. I want to say 99% completion was simply waiting on that dash. So, God, it's like pulling our teeth out waiting for it because we just want to get this piece finished. We're now at the stage of checking every single thing. We've put this list together, basically compromises of oils, lubricants, every nut and bolt that holds these Land Rovers together. As people know, these cars are like Meccano sets. Every nut and bolt has to be checked, torqued, some of them loctited and triple chalked just to be tested. As you can see here, we have got endless things to tick. We've designed it so we can put our signatures next to things. 
who built it, where did it come from, even down to every single light bulb, everything has to be inspected because we want these cars to go away and never come back. But we do bring these cars back after 30 days and check everything because things do become loose, especially when you go put in 700 horsepower Corvettes inside them. So don't be afraid guys, if you have a car from us, it's complimentary, we don't cost you for that inspection, bring it back to us and we'll check it. That's how confident we are in our work. So every car, we go underneath and we check everything. So as you'll see here, what I do, I buy different colour paint pens for different cars. So this one we've gone with silver. So as you can see here, I'm happy this diff has been full with Swepco to its maximum point. It's been checked, second checked, triple checked after a test drive. So we've gone through the swivels, we've gone through the steering arms. And what we do, we drill the silver line through it, so it's double checked. Old school, it works, and we repeat it. So if you want to come under here, you'll be able to see how much work has gone into this machine. So the exhausts have gone a lovely colour of gold. So you see the steering system. Michael bought this originally from a guy called Gwyn Lewis. Gwyn is local to us in Much Wenlock. He's gone for sumo bars for ultimate strength. He's gone for this galvanised steel cover. This protects the track rod, so if anything, any debris comes under the front axle, if it bends this track rod, some of you have probably seen some cars where they've been bent and the wheels are facing inwards. It looks quite comical, mostly when it's challenges, when a stump's come under here. Imagine that happening at speed, it wouldn't be fun. So extra protection for the ultimate occurrence, if you like. And I know Michael's going to be probably doing some crazy stuff with this, hooning around in it. Head towards the back, you see these mighty prop shafts, 1350 series, big yokes, big joints, to take the power. Nice big silencer. This engine is pretty varied without this. At the back here, we've got adrenaline rear trailing arms. These are made from T45 bent steel. Super strong, coupled with super pro bushes for the ultimate riding comfort, but also durability. And they come with lifetime warranty. So as we get near the back, you'll notice this mighty big lump of aluminium. So tell me about that, Sam. Yeah, that's, that's the fuel tank for one bat. It's got, it's got five baffles in it, I think, now, top of my head. So we've got a baffle this way, we've got two baffles this way, and another one in the top section. And then there's a small chamber here, just where the, uh, where the fuel pump takes the fuel from the tank. It has like a little bowl around it, so it's always got fuel in it, regardless of how you're throwing the truck around. So this gold stuff here is um, heat reflection for the exhaust, so you've got this merge here where it splits into the two sides so that comes past the tank here where it's got a recess for the tank, so if you see this bit here that sits just over the anti-roll bar that's extra that is, just to make this tank a little bit bigger so obviously it's a big engine, it's fairly, fairly thirsty The suspension on this car, so we've gone with a 2 inch coil lift on this car so these are, I believe, old man emu springs. Two inch heavy duty lift, but it's a really nice comfortable ride. But I gave Michael these amazing shocks. These are three inch Bill Stein pre-runner shocks. So these have been designed in Spain and believe me, I want to say they're probably the best in the business. They travel well, they take the bumps fast, respond well. Just do what, just do what we need to ask of them basically. We fitted those front and back and they just take the abuse. So on this car, we went with 20 inch SMC wheels. These wheels, we love them because they house our mighty AP brakes. As you'll notice here, we've gone for the extra touch. These are titanium bolts and we're going to lock wire these when they've been finally torqued, just for that extra finish with the HD drive flanges. As you can see up here, we approach Optimil for the ultimate hinges. They've supplied these and as you'll notice, these are blind bolted. So for those of you that are worried about losing your doors, very good deterrent. Right, so here I've got a little something that's a bit interesting and carries a little bit of history. So we were, we had to, we were requested to make a special handbrake for one of our builds, Wombat. Um, I don't know if you've seen the car, it's got quite a few quirky little upgrades that the guys asked us to fit. Um, so essentially this part here is started out as original Land Rover. This is um, a handbrake from an early Sherman tank, which we were given uh, by the customer. We've made this fit 
and um, work essentially with the, the factory Land Rover handbrake. It uses a standard Land Rover uh, cable going in there. So this is a vintage gear. Um, we had this lying around, it was 1942 it says on it. So we've cut that, we've welded it and attached it. It makes up the stop as well for the handbrake, so it's functional too. Um, and then just to finish it off, uh, we were given a load of non-live ammunition as well to fit on the end, so that's a 50 cal round. Uh, and that's that finishes the handbrake off nicely right. as you can see we've made it without changing the patina so it's got its original worn finish on it um, we've tried to uh, avoid changing that um, and basically just uh, it, it kind of suits the car it's really quirky and it's in theme for, for what the guy wants right let's go and fit it in the car and see what it looks like so first things first we're going to fit this um, this is obviously what we've just gone through. Um, the primary function of it is to fit there as a handbrake. So it fits within there. It's quite close to the dash as you can see. Um, it's not fully in because we need to trim around the carpet area for this. This, this car is having a custom aluminium dash so we've basically made it to fit with that. Um, obviously on, on the Land Rover you've got a transfer box and a gearbox. So this is your our transfer box. Um, bracket that's been made um, you'll see the paints quite tatty so what we're doing here is this one hasn't got any patina this one hasn't got any age related wear so we've painted it with four or five layers of paint which are all different colors and then we will patina this so it matches the original finish of this one this has obviously got a round on the end of it as well um, this has been resined on so we use clear resin which is a two-part um, you know resin and hardener um, so that's pretty strong and also it's going to sort of tie in with the look that the guy is going for and you'll have the two matching tops there like that and the car. So we made it work, we made it take the clevis pin from the Land Rover. So for the untrained eye this is going to be a quirky handbrake and obviously when it's applied it works the opposite. So we haven't got a button on the end, we've got a shell, very different. So you squeeze here to release, opposed to this one. I personally hate because when I drive the fenders, this sticks into my left leg. So we've also neutralised the angle of it. This one leans off to the right. So this one, you have to press the button. This one, you squeeze. Very different. I like it. It's quirky. And you know what? No other one else has got one. So last week guys, you would have seen us put the LS engine and gearbox into the chassis. So now I'm gonna talk you through what comes after you've put the engine in the chassis. Well, eagle-eyed viewers will notice this isn't the same chassis that we put the engine in last week. It is a different chassis, but the principle is exactly the same. Uh, the dimensions are the same, the mounts are the same. So after the engine's gone in, it's a case of making the Chevrolet part of the conversion work with the Land Rover part of the conversion. Yeah, so obviously to an engine conversion consists of a little bit more than just plonking the engine in the chassis. So as terms of the wiring goes, you have to allow a considerable amount of time to carefully plan your route. So where your wires are going to travel to and from, where they're gonna live, what kind of environment they're gonna live in, and what kind of protection they need to suit said environment. So, for example, all of these wires, we have got very little choice but to send them down the back of the engine. Now, that's, that's standard, that's where it usually is, right here. But obviously, because we, we're adding that one extra branch down there with the engine harness, which is on top of the redundant engine harness, which is soon to be removed. So we need to allow extra room there. And, uh, and another thing is this is having an automatic gearbox, which means it has, it has a small branch on the loom here for the plug that goes to the gearbox. It tells the gearbox what to do and tells the ECU what the gearbox is doing and so on and so forth. So, it, it's, it's very, very, very much worth 
put in a hefty amount of time into planning your route because you know should should you need to fault find something in the future be it six months down the line or a week down the line when you come to turn the key you need to know where it is where the wires that you need or the group of wires that you need to test or to use to diagnose it's best to know where they are and where they live in the driver's side seat box is where we're housing the engine ecu so that's that's chevrolet that's general motors uh, along with you see here we've got we've got two main looms here so here you see the slightly darker one this is the land rover original loom um, that you already have in your truck and then this is the loom that comes with the engine that's just the engine harness predominantly with a couple of outputs for like brake lights neutral switches and so on and so forth so what we've done is, is we've run both both looms into the same pocket on the box um, we run in the same fuse box as we would have if it was a Land Rover. Uh, the only difference really is some things that the Land Rover doesn't use anymore, like the glow plugs, so on and so forth, things that are relevant only to the engine that used to be in it. So what we need to do is, is we need to make this wiring loom talk the same language as this wiring loom. So the way we do that is we use a control unit like this. So this is called a canvas gateway. There's a number of these available. They all do a very similar thing. These clocks, these are the Land Rover clocks. So these are looking for parameters that the Land Rover ECU would be outputting usually. Uh, it's programmed to see those parameters. So obviously with us having put a Chevrolet engine in it, all those parameters are completely different and not relevant at all to the Land Rover clocks. So even if we were to wire the wires into this, it wouldn't read. So the way you get around that is you use a canvas interface or a gateway. So what this does is it takes the CAN signals from the General Motors side of it, turns it into a CAN signal that the clocks can read so that the RPM signal from the engine can be read by the factory clocks, engine temperature, oil pressure, ch check engine light, oil pressure light, so on and so forth, charging light. All those will still work as if it was a factory Land Rover. All these wires, all these plugs, all these sensors, they all go into that box, which is where we're using the interface to make them all talk to the Land Rover side of the wire in loom. The starter motor itself is a, it's a very high current device. So we've got the power supply here, the main power feed to the starter motor here. You can see with the red heat shrink on it here. So there's going to be a, a nice cover to go over here to protect it from the heat from the exhaust. So we have to be mindful that when we make the cables and we crimp the connections on that we leave, make sure that it's got the right angle, that it's not straining the cable, but we're leaving enough room for the guard because it is important to have guard around your wires. Obviously we still need a power source or a power supply. So we're using the old fashioned battery if you like. This isn't an old fashioned battery. This is an Odyssey Extreme Series. This is a very lightweight, high output battery. Where we have fitted this battery into the bespoke maker battery holder. It, it's just, it makes it so much easier. You know, we mount the, we mount the case for the battery that's got our own tie downs on it so that once we've got that situated the battery click in click out two bolts secured so you see here uh, there'll be a plastic shroud here for the gearbox controller or the gear stick if you like um, so I've just loosely tied these up here now so I know that's going to be where they're going to live obviously they'll have proper clips on but I need it to be there so that when I'm sizing all my boots for the strain relief as the loom comes through into this box it's all in the right place and it's not nice neat and tidy over here we've got the power supply the power supply we've got the ground, main ground as well uh, we're actually running three grounds on this currently at the moment we've grounded the engine we've grounded the engine to gearbox and then we've grounded the gearbox to the chassis so uh, we run the main power comes along here these are your power lines then we come into this box in this, in this box we've got auxiliary buzz bars 
for additional devices, whatever we want to add. Here we have the Land Rover section of the wiring loop. This is Land Rover. And this section here is General Motors. So we've got these boots here. These nice rubber boots here. Um, now these do a number of jobs. Aside from the obvious to keep the water and dirt out, these actually offer strain relief on the loom. So if for any reason the loom was to be snagged or to catch something or if someone to pull on it, anything, it pulls the boot and not the wires. So that can be a lifesaver. Yeah, so these are the fuel lines, as you can see, coming from the fuel tank. So. So these are another things that, that require a lot of consideration into where they're going to run. You don't want them to be exposed to the environment really any more than they need to be. You don't want them to be prone to getting smashed by a rock or a tree either. So you'll notice they're sitting on these P-clips that they, they wrap a rubber around the hole around this braiding. So this braiding can be quite rough, especially on a nice painted chassis like this. So these P-clips put a nice thick layer of rubber in between the braiding and whatever it's sitting on. So that's everything involved with connecting it up and the wiring side of things. So what we've got to do next is there's a little bit of plumbing for the steering, steering power steering lines. Um, we're going to flush the fuel through as we always do. Just flush a bit of fuel through there, make sure it's clean. Uh, put the fluids in. And that's we're good to go. So if you check out next week, hopefully we should be able to turn the key and it'll fire right up. The, the habit is to pull this out, the high and low. Ah, uh, right. That one is, it's very, it's a bit hard to pull it out, but the other one, it's quite easy. I'm fitting a panel here. It's got the gauge for the oil pressure, uh, the boost. Hold on. I need another hand. Have you wired yeah. that, ga that gauge up? Yes. The light? Yeah, okay. the wires. Yeah. yeah, I put the two wires Good and man. the pipe. So it lights up when you put this on? Oh, look at that, Louis. Oh, look at that. Mate. Fucking hell, he's on form now, Chris. I have got a trick for doing this, just not, not doing it right now. So I'm going to run this through the bulkhead, so I'm putting a rigid conduit on it. Because I'd also like to slip in a couple more groups of cable into there. By using this kind of conduit makes it easy. I've ever been in it, you have to press this to get yourself into a gear. The press what? To get into a gear? You have to press the dash. Oh, right. So you basically got drive here, park there, jump them. Well, it looks like it fits you really well. Snug, isn't it? Lovely detail, isn't it? Don't worry, it is sold, so today we're just going to be fitting this Hornet 2 to this bad boy and it's off to its new customer. <laughs> no, that's not going in there. Yeah. You ready? Well, it says here, <clears throat> obviously, Earth's going to go to body. But where do we put the plugs? 
Yeah, you're in and out. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not it's it's bad things, yeah. If I go to this angle, this looks ever, every <laughs> kind of awkward. It's like proper shunts in it. <laughs> it's fine with your oldies, mate, and then work from it. <laughs> so there we have it that is the latest hornet 2 fitted and we're hoping that alex has some awesome fun with this truck we're gonna put the rope on now put the jeep front cover back on and she's done should i put this t-shirt on while i'm putting this rope on It's prank time. I, I booted them, I did. What are they? That thing did the bite. This one? This one here? So we've had this vehicle come in and it had a faulty winch, so we've literally fitted a brand new unit. These guys are local to us, G8 Bradshaw and Sons. So we're fitted the winch in the back. This time they've gone for a giggle pin, GP100, twin motor monster, 24 volt. Let's just see how the guys are getting on. That's it for another week guys, thanks for watching. Do not forget, forget to subscribe. So drop a comment below if you wanna know anything else. Don't be afraid to ask any questions and don't forget there's gonna be a question and answer coming up soon. So ask honestly whatever you wanna do, drop that comment below, share it with your friends because we are gonna be doing a giveaway soon. So the more people involved, the higher chance we get to win. Thank you very much, see you guys.